Welcome to this week's message from Burwood United Methodist Church. I'm Tim Wood, the Supply Pastor, and I will be bringing you a message today based on Psalm chapter 119, verses 1 through 8. This passage is about respect and gratitude for the Torah, the set of instructions that God gave to the nation of Israel. I will be describing what the Torah is, what it means to the Israelites, and what Torah means to us today. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. Those whose way is blameless, who walk in the Lord's instruction, are truly happy. Those who guard God's laws are truly happy. They seek God with all their hearts. They don't even do anything wrong. They walk in God's ways. God, you have ordered that your decrees should be kept most carefully. How I wish my ways were strong when it comes to keeping your statutes. Then I wouldn't be ashamed when I examine your commandments. I will give thanks to you with a heart that does right as I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Please don't leave me all alone. That ends the reading of the scripture. Today we're doing a deep dive into the Old Testament into the longest chapter of any book of the Bible. Psalm 119. No, I won't try to cover all 176 verses. The first eight verses spell out the theme of this great psalm. It is a celebration of the Torah. Following the Torah gave the Israelites happiness and a better relationship with God. It also helped them understand themselves. First, I'll describe the Torah, then I'll talk about its importance to us now. The first five books of the Bible are referred to as the Torah. The word Torah also can be interpreted as the instructions given by God to the ancient Israelites at Mount Sinai. After escaping Egypt, Moses led the Israelites to Mount Sinai, also called the Mountain of God. Many of the great events of the Bible happen at Mount Sinai, also known as Mount Horeb. The Torah also is referred to as the Law. It contains hundreds of detailed rules on how to conduct worship, offer sacrifices, and most importantly, live the way God wants us to live. The poet of Psalm 119 employs a common wisdom form in composing the psalm, the acrostic. This term describes a poem in which the first letters of certain words, if placed one after another, would form a word. For example, take the word grace. The saying, God's riches at Christ's expense, is an acrostic formed of the first letters of the word grace. G, God's, R, riches, A, at, C, Christ, and E, expense. Psalm 119 is identified as a wisdom composition because of the acrostic form, its content, and its message. Wisdom psalms provide instruction in right living and right faith in the tradition of the other wisdom writings of the Old Testament. In most psalms, the path to wisdom is through obeying the Torah, the instruction of the Lord. Verses 1 through 8 of Psalm 119 each begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The first two verses begin with a word that is translated as happy or blessed. The first verse of the first chapter of the Psalms also begins with that word. Psalm 1-1 reads, The truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice, doesn't stand on the road of sinners, and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. The state of being happy or blessed comes from following the instruction of the Lord. Torah has become for the psalmist much more than the laws by which Israel should live. Torah has become a personal way to God. Now, let me say that a person's path to God begins with accepting the gift of salvation, which is the result of God's grace. Following a set of rules by itself does not bring salvation. Belief in God's grace through Jesus Christ starts a person on a faith journey. After starting that journey, the believer has a new motivation to do good works and to follow the teachings of the Lord through Bible study, prayer, experience, and reasoning. Through those ways, a person learns more about following God's teachings. The results of following God's teachings can be found in the first two verses of Psalm 119. Those who ways blameless who walk in the Lord's instruction are truly happy. Those who guard God's laws are truly happy. They seek God with all their hearts. Torah is any teaching of God, not just the Old Testament teachings. We follow God's laws, but they are written on our hearts, not always on paper. So what exactly is written on our hearts? I don't know, but a good choice would be the two greatest commandments. Jesus himself summarized the whole Torah by saying that we should love God with every ounce of our being 
and love our neighbor as we would want ourselves to be loved. Jesus said, all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. What an amazing world it would be if everyone treated others as they want to be treated themselves. We wouldn't need as many written laws. I try to evaluate my words and actions against this standard, and I don't always measure up to it. Actually, we should strive to go beyond treating others as we would ourselves. How about treating others better than we would want ourselves treated? And an act or word that wouldn't bother me might upset another person. The early nation of Israel loved and respected the Torah. However, they didn't always follow it. The Israelites went through a cycle with God. Follow God's teachings. Disobey God's teachings. Suffer the consequences and then receive mercy and forgiveness from God. The cycle continued until God had had enough of it. He allowed Jerusalem and Judah to be conquered by warriors who sacked the city, destroyed the temple, and took a great number of Israelites to Babylon, where they would stay for 70 years. After the Israelites were released, they headed back to Jerusalem. A man named Nehemiah led the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem and helped organize the people by registering families. Seven months after their return, it was time for the Israelites to hear the instructions of the Lord for the first time in decades. For some who were born in exile, they would be, this would be the first time they would hear the instructions of the Lord. Their reactions were recorded in the eighth chapter of Nehemiah. The people invited the priest Ezra to read the scroll of instruction. As he began, the people stood up in reverence. When Ezra blessed the Lord, the people answered, Amen, Amen, while raising their hands. The twofold Amen expresses agreement with the blessing of the Lord and acceptance of the law. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This act showed their obedience and submission to God. As Ezra read from the scroll, the people wept because of their sins and the punishment which is to come upon them. Ezra read for six hours. The people paid rapt attention the entire time. For the Israelites, the Torah had a power far beyond that of mere words. On a symbolic level, Psalm 119 verses 1 through 8 refers to Jesus. Jesus prayed this psalm in a symbolic way. Jesus praised this psalm through the church, the body of believers. Jesus Christ fulfilled the Torah in that he lived a blameless life. In his time on earth, Jesus sought God with his whole heart. Jesus was the one who could truly say, I will observe thy statutes. I'm going to read a story from Rachel Mole, a minister who described how a challenging situation led her to Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. This is what she said. I have difficulty obeying some of the laws, especially the one dealing with covetousness. My daughter, the mother of our two beautiful granddaughters, lives in another state. Her father and I have been divorced for many years, but our relationships with each other and our respective new mates have improved since we are now grandparents. Or so I thought. One day my daughter called and explained what they were going to do and they visited her father for four days. Four days? They don't visit us very often and they never stay for more than two days. We make the seven-hour trip every other month to ensure that our four- and six-year-old granddaughters know their grandparents. My feelings were hurt and jealousy's ugly head rose quickly and strongly. I hung up the phone and cried on my husband's shoulder. I decided not to talk to my daughter again that day. By the next morning, I was much better and had gotten things into perspective. I called my daughter and thanked her for giving me some time to get my house in order. I reassured her that her family is very important to us. Visits to us are not a condition for us to be part of their lives. I had reminded myself of the reasons her father is not able to visit them as frequently as we can. I remembered that the girls would be on summer vacation and we would be at a yearly conference. I had moved from the jealous woman to the loving mother and grandmother. But it was not easy. It took time and effort and, in all honesty, I didn't even think about the commandment. Thou shalt not covet. What I did was read Psalm 119 verses 1 to 4, and I discovered to my complete astonishment that I was happy. I had obeyed the commandment and in doing so enabled my daughter and her family to be with her father without guilt or worry. We were both free because I finally followed God's command. And that's the end of her story. The psalmist said that those who follow the Lord are truly happy. So what's the difference between being happy and being truly happy? True happiness endures. 
True happiness comes from God. Happiness that is not truly happiness depends on one's earthly circumstances. The words translated as happy or blessed are based on the same word whose basic meaning is to walk in a prescribed path and stay on it. The metaphor of walking appears throughout the psalm to express the sum of one's behaviors and activities. Thus, to walk in the law describes following the law in every respect. I often have said that God does not guarantee his happiness. However, after studying this passage of scripture, I realized that I was wrong. Have you ever heard a preacher admit they were wrong? The first eight verses of Psalm 119 tell us that God does guarantee true happiness if you follow God's instruction. The Israelites had the written law to follow in order to feel true happiness. What are we supposed to follow? We are to follow the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Torah. Following Jesus gives us true happiness. Ancient rabbis thought of the Torah, the eternal law of God, as the basis on which all created reality is based. Thus, to be in accord with God's Torah is to connect to reality, that is, with what is. It can connect you to the reality of your heart and soul. The nearer you are to God's Torah, the nearer you are to your true self. Following God helps us understand ourselves. God knows us, as described in Psalm 139. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. So, following the law is the way to the best life, the life that truly is life. It leads to true happiness. We are human and thus still vulnerable to temptation. Even believers fail to follow the law. That disrupts our relationship with God. We may lose that feeling of true happiness for a short time, but as we resume following God's instructions, the true happiness returns. Following the law leads to life, the life that is truly worth living. Amen.